Welcome, everybody, to our annual dinner. We are so fortunate to have all of you who support the New Hampshire Humanities here with us. Thank you. My name is Ellen Scarponi, and I am very proud to be the chair of the board of the New Hampshire Humanities. Here tonight, <laughs> thank you. It's the best organization going. Here tonight to share in our celebration is our esteemed governor. But before I introduce him, um, I was presented today, or we were presented with a proclamation that he sent to us, and I wanted to read it. A proclamation. In the year of our Lord, 2018, Arts and Humanities Month, October 2018, whereas arts and humanities in all forms play an important role in creating a vibrant culture in New Hampshire, and whereas the arts and humanities enrich our communities and help bring meaning and new perspectives to our lives, whereas it is important to recognize the innovation, creativity, and talents of those who dedicate themselves to practicing the arts and humanities and to encourage those who are studying them to continue to pursue their passions. Yes. <laughs> and whereas promoting the arts and humanities contributes to the economy, drives tourism, and improves our overall quality of life. Whereas businesses and local community leaders help support efforts to strengthen the arts in New Hampshire by contributing to vital programs at both the local and state level. And whereas Arts and Humanities Month is a time to honor and celebrate the unique joy the arts bring to our world, to celebrate our cultural diversity and embrace the differences of our humanity. Now, therefore, I, Christopher T. Sununu, Governor of the State of New Hampshire, do hereby proclaim October 2018 as Arts and Humanities Month in the State of New Hampshire and call this to the citizens, uh, the attention of all citizens. Thank you, Governor. We appreciate it. And now it is my pleasure to recognize, to thank, and ask our Honorable Governor, Chris Sununu, to the podium, please. Hey, hey, thank you very much. That was great. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, please sit. I am not the main attraction, thank goodness. Uh, well, thank you very much. I wanted to just take a couple minutes and um, obviously, I mean, look around, right? The room is packed. Uh, things are really going well. People are really appreciating uh, not just what this organization does, but really what the humanities does, what it really means um, in New Hampshire, uh, the value that it brings. Uh, and it's great, you know, Valerie's been on the board for quite some time. And, and for those of you who don't know, you know, Valerie is the humanities brain. I'm the engineering brain. Um, and uh, it's, it, it's a great match. It's a great compliment. Uh, but having her involved um, has really, I don't want to say opened my eyes, but really I think opened a lot of doors and paths into the state house, into the value of these conversations. And I mean, that's the real, we have the conversations, right? We have the, those intellectual conversations. But what the New Hampshire Humanities is really doing, which I didn't anticipate, but you, we've created safe spaces, right? Spaces where we can have dialogue, where we can talk, where we can disagree without being disagreeable. Um, we just do it a very differently here in New Hampshire. And one thing we try to do is then say, okay, well, with that dialogue, with those conversations, what are we going to get out of it? What, how do we use that as a tool at the state level? Um, and, and, I mean, I could give you a couple examples. One would be uh, mental health, right? So we come into office. We have a major mental health crisis in the state. And I said, okay, bring everybody in. And it was quite a day. We just brought all the stakeholders in. We brought providers. We brought the bureaucrats. We brought anybody who understood what this issue was and where some of the system had been breaking down, we brought in. And I have more of an engineering mindset. But then we brought in folks from the humanities, folks that understood really how to manage the dialogue and add to that conversation. Because you can't, especially in the state house, right? We don't have all the answers in the state house. We don't. I mean, we're, it's our job to go out and get them and encourage more people to the table and coalesce those ideas and do it with positivity and do it with creativity. And having the humanities aspect, that part of the dialogue, which frankly, I don't know has, if it has been there in quite a while, but to have that dialogue there 
putting together on the table, that's how you're just going to get the best results. And we have. I mean, things are going very, very well. Um, there's no denying that. We have a lot of challenges ahead of us. Um, so this is just basically my way of first saying thank you for all of you who really helped participate in those conversations and those dialogue. Um, um, I was thinking also of uh, out on the Seacoast, you guys did the, the Elephant in the Room series, which was awesome. Um, that was a heck of a series. Hey, give yourself a hand for that. That was a great series. For those of you who don't know, I mean, that series really started talking about the elephants in the room, the sticky issues, those really tough issues that sometimes we don't want to talk about, right? Sometimes we're afraid, oh, if we talk about this issue, you know, we're going to burn bridges or something like that. Look, maybe that's the way they do it in the other 49 states. I don't know. But here, it's very different, right? And your voice as part of that dialogue and creating those spaces and creating that structure so we can really build on that and use it to make sure the whole state is moving forward, I just can't thank you enough. Um, and, and on behalf of the legislature, the all 400 members, the 24 senators, the five executive counselor, and a, an engineering mindset governor who really is starting to appreciate the value of having that dialogue when we're crafting these solutions, it really means everything and is what is truly helping keep New Hampshire uh, as part of that gold standard across the country. So thank you guys so much. Thank you for everything you do. Just keep growing it, keep being part of it, uh, and keep using us as that tool to keep moving things forward. Thank you guys. Thank you, Governor Sununu, um, it, for your appreciation of the work we do and for your support. And Valerie, a shout out, you're, you're right over there somewhere. Valerie has brought po podcasts to our board of directors, and now we know how to use them. <laughs> Thank you very much. Since we last met, our organization has done a great deal of reflection on ourselves and on our direction. Our efforts have been centered on ways to concisely articulate what our New Hampshire Humanities is all about. You know, it's, it's been like Mercury trying to explain over the years. But what we're all about is engagement, exclamation point. Our mission, bringing people together to explore the human experience, has never been more important. We believe that the new title of our character, of our calendar, excuse me, engage, exclamation, sums up our message and what we invite all of you to do. As Sharon McCarthy noted when she came up with the winning title of our calendar, quote, the best things happen when people are truly engaged. I think New Hampshire Humanities embodies this quality and encourages engagement with everything they do, unquote. Thank you, Sharon, for articulating it so well. And I hope you've all seen our new calendar. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. You are here tonight because you support our great organization, and thank you again for that. And we also believe that you support us because you also benefit from the work we do. So, if you have attended a Humanities To Go event, been a part of our Connections program, received a Humanities grant, attended a Constitutionally Speaking event, climbed a mountain with us, or feel you've benefited in any other way, please raise your hands. <laughs> See what I mean? You are engaged. Thank you. Tonight, we also make good on a promise that we made at last year's event to find just the right person to be our new executive director. Our search committee was tasked with finding the ideal candidate who must be a passionate advocate for the humanities and their relevance, be a highly persuasive public communicator, and be a proven leader and operational manager to boot. Anthony Poor found us, and we found him, and it's a perfect match. I am pleased to tell you that he hit the road running on March 1st and has been going at lightning speed ever since. You'll meet him shortly if you haven't already. Anthony's success working with our outstanding staff, encouraging them to go and challenging them to go above and beyond is evident in many places. So let's watch our new video to see just how much has been accomplished. Thank you. For more than four decades, New Hampshire Humanities has invited citizens to engage in free public programs 
that help us think creatively and critically, to reason and reflect, and to ask the big questions of our time. In this complex and changing world, exploring the humanities gives us a better understanding of our society, our world, and what unites us as humans. This is New Hampshire Humanities. Right now, as our lives are becoming more digital and robotic, the need for the human experience and the humanities is more prevalent. In our busy lives, we often don't take the time to talk to our neighbors, to talk to the other people in our community about our hopes, our dreams, the things that really matter to us. And what New Hampshire Humanities does is provide space and time uh, for reflection, for thinking, uh, for imagination, uh, and for community as well. And the more your brain does mental gymnastics around an idea, thinking about it differently, the more enlightened you can become and the more connected we become as people. And we've been doing this uh, for 44 years. And in the 44 years, we've reached over 2 million people. And I think that's an extraordinary number. Uh, if you think about the work that we even did just last year, we impacted over 147,000 people in the state. We've impacted 183 different communities and partnered with over 273 different organizations around that state. That is a heck of a number. We're an organization that's responding to changes in our everyday experience, in our life. The world is changing and we need to change with it. Most unnatural was the applause of leaves. It lacked the crackle of an umber wing. New Hampshire Humanities has been around for several decades. You know, they've done a lot of great work with different communities and with people and putting on amazing programs. But one of the things that I'm really excited about is that we're really open to change and figuring out, you know, what people in the future, people moving to this state, people who have been here a long time, how do they also connect to this organization? The Elephant in the Room series was a, a series of programs focused on difficult issues, things that we find um, difficult to discuss. Tonight we have the opioid crisis and in particular uh, its effect on families. New Hampshire Humanities is willing to tackle subjects that other funding organizations won't touch. They offer structure and support to reach out and, and really push to make sure an organization like mine, which is small, has the resources to tackle difficult topics. What is it that causes human beings to want to enslave and force others, coerce others? We had more young people in the theater for that program than we have for many of other programs. It's engaging both the youth and the older generations in a conversation that we should be having and the types of conversations that are hard to have but really push us forward. We have to honor and respect our past and at the same time recognize that as society changes, we need to change with it. It's not an either or, it's an and. It's about New Hampshire stone walls and it's about wealth and equality. It's about New Hampshire and New England quilts, but it's also about issues related to inclusion. And as such, we've adopted our philosophies. And those guiding principles represent access, innovation, and elevation. And I'm very excited to think about how we can reach new people, how we can bring more people in, what kinds of changes we could even make to some of the programs to be more inclusive and more accessible. Once I got to know people, the story of the state, I started to feel more connected to it. The humanities does help people change and grow. That's the experience I've had in my own life. To be able to formulate our own stories is the way for us to understand what happened to us. We can find uh, commonality uh, through stories, through thinking about what it is we really want, what we want our future to look like, what we want our communities to look like. Hope and uh, conflict, they have always been here and hope has always won. I wake up every single day thinking about how we can positively impact the lives of people in the state in ways that they've never even dreamed of yet. Thank you. I, I need to be honest, that, watching that video was incredibly humbling. So if I stutter or stammer, it's only because I'm nervous and I might cry. So please forgive me. For those that don't know me, my name is Anthony Poor, and tonight I have the pleasure 
and the honor of introducing myself as the Executive Director of New Hampshire Humanities. I want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy days and your lives and taking the time away from your families to enjoy this year's annual dinner. And for those of you who don't know, this is my very first annual dinner. And so obviously I'm nervous and I'm excited as heck to have you all with us. This evening wouldn't be made possible, frankly, as we know, if it wasn't for the support of our sponsors. And frankly, there are too many to name. But the reality is if you look at the back of your event uh, brochure or uh, um, guide, if you will, they're all listed there. In particular, though, I think it's important that we recognize our lead sponsor, and that's Dartmouth College, for their support. And it's been long, a long-term support that they provided us. So yes, that's right. And I also want to thank our dinner sponsors for this evening, which is Consolidated Communications, McLean Communications, and the University of New Hampshire. Thank you so much. Now, when I was raised in Ohio, my granddaddy told me a long time ago that many hands make for light work. And as you can imagine, with the number of people here in this room, it required an awful lot of work on our part. And that was done by the hardworking staff of New Hampshire Humanities. I would be foolish if I didn't stop and thank them and recognize them. So I'd like the staff of New Hampshire Humanities to stand up, please, and be recognized. And in particular, I want to thank Donna Bailey, Sue Butman, Lynn Dillette, Terry Farish, Susan Hadem, Dr. Tricia Pion, Morgan Wilson, and in particular, I want to thank Becky Kinnon, Rachel Morin, and Jane Pauley for their hard work and effort in pulling tonight together. It frankly was an all hands on deck moment, as you can imagine, with a small organization like our own. I'd be remiss if I didn't thank our board of directors, in particular, Ellen Scarponi, for your leadership and direction and the support that you provide me. Thank you. I also want to thank our friends, our family, our supporters, and our allies, and I want to thank a special couple this evening. I want to thank Ruth Smith and Beth McGuinn, who've chosen to celebrate their 25th wedding anniversary with us tonight. Isn't that amazing? Where are you at? I want you to stand, be recognized. Yeah. I hope I didn't embarrass you, but at 25 years is a wonderful accomplishment, and we're proud of you. Now, you heard it in the video. Two million people in 44 years. That's amazing. And you may ask yourself, how the heck did we get to that number? Well, it's through a combination of traditional programs, digital humanities and media projects, of which we're doing a tremendous amount of right now, our adult literacy programs, and our K-12 through projects with teachers and students alike. Well, many of you may or may not know some of our current programs. And for those who don't know, we have our Humanities to Go program. And I think by a show of hands, I'm quick, how many of you have heard about our Humanities to Go program? As you can see, there we go, that's right, all right? Now that's, for example, I would call that our bread and butter. We have 100 scholars and presenters who offer currently 200 programs across the state, uh, free of charge. So whether you're above the notch, north, south of the notch, the Seacoast, or the Monadnock region, there's a Humanities program in your neighborhood. Second of all, we have our community project grants. For those that don't know, these are our responsive grants to our local um, nonprofit organizations and cultural organizations who have an interest in bringing the humanities to their communities. We want to support them as well. And I'm so proud of our work with the Connections Program. This is our adult literacy program where we support the needs of our uh, English as second language learners and our adult basic uh, language learners. And for those that don't know, our work in prisons, both at the federal and state level, as we seek to make sure that those who are interned maintain those connections with their families, because someday they're getting out and they'll need support. That's right. And last, it's our, it's our special projects. Many of you may have heard about our veterans projects, particularly our Dialogue on War series, our uh, hosting young philosophy enthusiasts that we partnered with the UNH, and I'm so excited to announce our new series entitled Ideas on Tap, right? And we'll be launching the first in this series on October 30th at the Barley House. We encourage you all to come. And the title of this program is Making Our Way in Post-Fact America. And you can see information in the event brochure as well. Now, looking ahead and to maximize our impact, we adopted an organizational philosophy 
that we believe it can is easily summarized into three easily understood words. And what are they? You heard that in the video. Access, innovation, and elevation. Now, you may ask yourself, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to tell you. It means opening minds and opening doors and leveraging our unique role as a convener, as a funder, into the catalyst for lifelong learning. Now, how are we doing that right now, in this very moment? We're identifying new venues, and we've identified new experiential learning models to engage people in you in new, unique ways. We're working with new partners from completely outside of our sector in an effort to bring new people into this world called the humanities who may not otherwise been able to participate. It means identifying and integrating new delivery models and innovative programming. So right now we're leveraging technology to reach a wider array of audiences than we've ever done before. And we're exploring right now employer-based fee-for-service programs where we can bring the humanities into the workspace in ways that we've never been able to do before. And lastly, it means elevating New Hampshire humanities impact by creating and nurturing innovative collaborative relationships. Now, many of you may have seen in that video uh, most recently, our participation with the Blue Trees Project. Alan, Alan Chong, I believe you're here, sir, somewhere. There you are. I hope you enjoyed that in the video. We were so honored. That's right. That's right. We were so honored to partner with the Courier Museum of Art in this way and bringing attention to issues of preservation, conversation, and place. And myself and Inez McDermott, our former board uh, member, was really, oh, there you go, Inez, there you go, and the staff at New England College. We're so helpful in pulling us together, we can't thank you enough. Now, given the nation's changing demogra demographic profile, divisive political environment, and the erosion of trust in our public institutions, the civil exchange of ideas and perspectives is more important than ever before. As we work towards expanding our tent and making sure that no matter which side of that tent you come on, there's a seat ready, willing, and able for you to sit in. We've adopted a philosophy that honors and respects our past, but allows us to move into our new season. Now, it's about New Hampshire lighthouses, and it's about issues of wealth and income inequality. It's about New Hampshire town meeting, and it's about this so-called fake news world we live in. It's about discovering New Hampshire covered bridges, and it's about the intersections of artificial intelligence, technology, and the humanities. Because it's never an either or, it's always an and. Oh, well, thank you. All right. And as such, as the Executive Director of New Hampshire Humanities, and on behalf of our staff, we want to invite you to join us on this new epic journey that we're about to, to impart on. It's not about asking for your money or how large your pocketbook is. It's about engaging us in new and innovative ways. It's about creating sustainable communities and equitable economies where our neighbors and those that we hold dear can live and work, can grow and thrive, and dream and aspire. And we want you to come along on this journey with us. And gosh darn it, it's gonna be a heck of a ride. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now here's a little fun thing we're going to do as we make our way into dinner. Now, in the spirit of new and exciting, we are honored to have with us tonight 35 young people. These are Suzuki violin students who have never met until tonight, right? They're from across New Hampshire, and they're from the programs of the Upper Valley Music Center, the Seacoast Academy of Music, the Sue Ann Herb, and the Manchester Community School. And they'll be performing a short concert for you this evening as we transition into dinner. I want to thank our New Hampshire Humanities Board member Jackie Hudkins, I think is right there, if I'm not mistaken, for making this happen. And I want to thank Ben Van Vliet, who's the Executive Director of the Upper Valley Music Center, for their support in helping make this happen. Thank you so much. Without further ado, I got 35 young people about to make your toes curl, so make it happen.
Thank you so much. We are so excited to be here playing for you. I'd like to thank Jackie Hudkins again for providing the spark that got all of us on stage here tonight, and the New Hampshire Humanities Council for giving us a chance to share our music with you. Because um, as you can see, it means a lot to us. That was a piece by Antonin Dvorak called The Humoresque. We're gonna play three short pieces for you now. A folk song called Oh Come Little Children, a piece called Hunter's Chorus, and then a musette by Johann Sebastian Bach. We have two pieces left for you. One of them you may not recognize. Uh, the second, I think you will.
if you are inspired, join us on this last one. You'll see what I mean. Well, we hope you enjoyed that uh, bit of a musical interlude. And again, I want to thank uh, the Suzuki Violin students for your hard work and obviously under the direction of Ben Van, Van Vliet, if I get that right. And uh, you're welcome anytime. What do you say? Deal? All right, cool. Thanks, guys. Now, listen, we're going to transition into dinner and we'll be back in a moment. So please enjoy. Thank you. was that? Did you like that? That was my little musical interlude. That is about the most musical you'll ever find me. All right. So I, I want to get everybody's attention if I could. We're going to reconvene just for a bit. And I got to tell you, this is the most important part of the evening for me. So if you wouldn't mind, if I could get your attention, I'd appreciate it. Now, I have the opportunity to introduce one of our board members, Steve Genest. Now, for those that don't know Steve Genest, he's a wonderful guy. And he's been a sincere and dear friend to us at New Hampshire Humanities. And he's also a graduate of St. A's, which I'll let him tell you a little bit about. There we go, St. A's represent. There we go. Now, that being said, Steve, where are you, sir? You're around here in the audience somewhere. There you are. Steve, without further ado, Mr. Genest. Thank you. Uh, tonight we have an award that we would like to present, and the purpose of this award this evening is to honor the work of individuals who have made an outstanding contribution to public understanding of the humanities. The commi commitment of the Graponis to the humanities in New Hampshire was most recently demonstrated by their substantial gift to St. Anselm College to establish the Gregory J. Depo Graponi Humanities Institute in honor of their son, Greg. This innovative new institute will challenge and encourage humanistic thoughts in the lives of young people and in the citizens of the New Hampshire community for decades to come. Tonight, a table, somewhere's out there, of St. Anselm students have joined us to honor the legacy of Greg Graponi and to show their appreciation to the Graponi family for their transformative and inspiring gift. In recognition of their contribution to the humanities, New Hampshire Humanities would like to present to the Graponi family a picture entitled Along the Path by New Hampshire artist Catherine Green as well as a plaque that reads, 2018 Excellence in the Humanities Award, the Graponi family in memory of Greg Graponi. Thank you.
those who think that uh, Anthony Poor, our executive director, was really nervous, raise their hands. I don't think you were nervous. <laughs> This is Amanda Graponi Osma. She's my daughter. <laughs> She's extremely active in the community, and uh, I appreciate her individual efforts. Uh, <laughs> to be a part of the quality of the, that New Hampshire really is. This is kind of an unintended consequence because over three years ago, I started communicating with our son, Greg, who was, uh, had some difficulty with his health. And I figured that in all probability, I was gonna outlive him. So I needed to figure out a way to communicate with this young man on a daily basis. So he had in his, on his coffee table Calendar of Wisdom by Leo Tolstoy. Happened to have been right at the right time of the year. It was just before January 1st. So I, I asked him if he would like to participate on a daily basis. And we did until the day he died. He didn't miss a day. In the meantime, I asked a friend to join us and shortly after that, we were dubbed the Tolstoy Trio. Then subsequent to that, there are several people in our circle that participate on a daily basis, and most of them wouldn't miss it. And why is it important, and why am I driven like this? And I came up with a phrase just a little while ago. Evolution has played a trick on us. Through our collective amnesias, we have reduced real knowledge to legends and fables. So if I was going to communicate with a young man who was highly skeptical about this world and what, it's, what this culture is teaching him, what's the best thing to do? Best thing to do is find the best third party available, and that was Leo Tolstoy. And it's been a marvelous experience, and it's dovetailed into and, uh, and created a passion for me to connect with a wonderful institution at St. Anselm's College. I played a little sports when I was younger, but as, as you go through the years, you know there's a lot, a lot of things more important than just uh, a sports contest. And it's extremely important that the impressionable youth of today get a hold of their own intuitive sense. And they can only do that if they have a good third party like Leo Tolstoy and all of the things that, all of the different uh, wonderful quotes that he pulled out of the great books so that the, the individual is going to think for themselves and maybe lift the fog of what seems to clutter our minds in today's world and get an intuitive sense, become an individual, and come back to common sense. And I'd like to thank St. Anselm's College for this initiative. They're tremendously enthusiastic about it. We're having a dedication next uh, Wednesday. And uh, in the book here, I can probably tell you, because they have a student blog, but rather, go on a, rather going on a daily basis, uh, Gary Boucher thought of a, a, a great uh, phrase, Wis wins Wisdom Wednesdays. And uh, we post a uh, page from Tolstoy, and then, they, then the uh, students participate. And if you want to get on the blog, and anybody's uh, welcome, it's humanitiesblog.anselm.edu. And I would like to thank uh, just everyone for, uh, for this award. It, it means a lot, I'm sure, to uh, the college 
and uh, I just appreciate everything. Thank you. Wisdom Wednesdays and being able to perpetuate that. Thank you again to the Graponis for making it happen. Um, what a tribute. We really appreciate it. Thank you for believing in and supporting the humanities. Now it's time for our keynote address. We are so grateful to our lead sponsor, Dartmouth College, and are excited to have such a strong partner in our work to promote the humanities in New Hampshire. I would like to rec rec yeah, excuse me. I would like to welcome Dr. Graziella Peretti. Don't you love her name? <laughs> Graziella was originally an immigrant from Milano, Italy and then a professor, and now is the director of the Leslie Center for the Humanities at Dartmouth College, and I'm happy to say, a New Hampshire Humanities board member. She will introduce our keynote speaker. Graziella. So I have managed to have a lot of anxieties for tonight. But this is also the best radio voice that I will ever have in my life. It also, it almost feels unnecessary to introduce Susan Stanberg to this audience. But I will do my best to recap her wonderful career. And I think that I'm speaking for everybody by saying that she will not be allowed to retire ever. We want her on the radio forever. <laughs> Susan Stamberg is a nationally and internationally renowned broadcast journalist. And uh, sometimes technology is fantastic because wherever I travel, whether it is in Australia or Europe, I can listen to her on the, on the computer. It's fantastic. And I do not embrace technology all the time. <laughs> so she is a nationally and internationally renowned broadcast journalist and a special correspondent for NPR. A native of New York City, Stanberg is a graduate of Barnard College and has been award awarded numerous honorary degrees, including a Doctor of Humane Letters from Dartmouth College. I have to mention that as I am from Darwin. She is a fellow of Silliman College, Yale University, and has served on the boards of the Penn Faulkner Fiction Award Foundation and the National Arts Journalism Program based at Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Stember is the first woman to anchor a national nightly news program and has won every major award in broadcasting. So I'm particularly delighted that she has joined us in Manchester, New Hampshire tonight. She has been inducted into the Broadcasting Hall of Fame and the Radio Hall of Fame. An NPR founding mother, Stenberg has been on staff since the network began in 1971. Stember served as co-host of NPR's award-winning news magazine, All Things Considered, for 14 years. She started when she was 10. <laughs> she then hosted Weekend Edition Sunday and now reports on cultural issues for Morning Edition and Weekend Edition Saturday. Susan, please make an effort to give us some good news during broadcast. <laughs> 
one of the most popular broadcasters in public radio. Stenberg is well known for her conversational style, intelligence, and knack for finding interesting stories. Her thousands of interviews include conversations with Laura Bush, Billy Crystal, Rosa Parks, Dave Brubeck, and an Italian, Luciano Pavarotti. <laughs> Prior to joining NPR, she served as producer, program director, and general manager of NPR member station WAMU-FM, Washington, D.C. She is the author of two books, and, co and she co-edited a third. The first book is Talk, NPR's Susan Stamberg Considers All Things, the Chronicles are Two deca Decades with NPR. And another book, Every Night at Five, Susan Stamberg's All Nights Considered book that was published in 1982 by Pantheon. Stamberg also co-edited The Wedding Cake in the Middle of the Road, published in 1992 by Norton. I absolutely adore this book, and you'll know why in a minute. Presented to 23 writers, the challenging idea for this book was to create a short story, um, to create short stories suitable for radio, incorporating the image of a wedding cake in the middle of the road. So you have to keep a piece of the cake tonight and find a way somehow to take it to the middle of some road somewhere in New Hampshire. The plots of the show stories include a bride and a groom with their shoes covered with frosting, a dumping ground for plastic wedding cakes, and I quote, the prettiest place plastic ever made, a groom removed by crows from a wedding cake, the issue in the show story is to bring the cake to a road. For example, a delivery man is attacked by a dog and drops the cake. A couple happen upon a stop delivery van and steal a slice of the cake inside. An infatuated man forms a cake snow sculpture in the middle of a western trail. A photographer sets a cake down in the middle of the road for the sake of taking a particularly engaging sh uh, shot. A drunken and romantically depressed young man sets a cake down in order to watch it get, to watch it get run over. A mysterious woman, mysterious woman in a pickup drops it out of her window as a means to catch the protagonist's attention, etc., etc. So now is your duty tonight to find additional plots. And talking about food, my colleague, Andrea Tarnowski, who is the Associate Director of the Humanities Center at Dartmouth, she's sitting over there, asked me to thank Susan Stamberg for her annual Thanksgiving sharing on NPR. <laughs> of a cranberry relish recipe that looks like, and I quote her, a Pepto-Bismol dish, <laughs> but tastes terrific. She says. So join me in welcoming Susan Stamberg. I knew somebody would mention that recipe, but I thought it might come later. <laughs> Thank you for the terrific introduction and for having me here. This has been just a grand time for me. Uh, the work that you do is extraordinary. Somebody gave me a catalog today of all the various events and talks and activities associated with this organization. And honestly, if I lived here, and it made me want to, I think I would find something to do every day because you're just so busy, and you're so busy doing good in good places. So I have to get out my spontaneous ad-libs. 
<laughs> and I'm really happy to be uh, invited. I, the last time I looked it up in, uh, in my records, the last time I was in New, New Hampshire, I've been here several times in different places, but the last time was to Gilmanton. Who here has been to Gilmanton? Really? Why? <laughs> Well, I had a good excuse. I was doing, of course, a story on Peyton Place. This was, I think it was around 1995, it was a while ago. Uh, and they had just, it was, it was the anniversary of the book, I think it came out in 55, did it? I was a mere child then, but read every page, especially the good parts, as those of my generation and succeeding generations tended to do. So we went uh, up there, a producer and an engineer and I, and we had just a grand time. We found people who all claimed to have been Grace Metellius' best friend. Of course, I don't think anyone knew her, but nonetheless. And uh, we went into the library. This was the most interesting part to me. And they did not have a copy of Peyton Clay. And I was shocked, shocked, I tell you. But, uh, but I had a copy, I brought it along. And I got the librarian to read that, the first page of it. Uh, Indian Summer is like, oh, I can't do it for you. But uh, I was just looking at it the other day, uh, getting ready to talk to you. And she, you know, there, there were all these rumors that she hadn't written it because she wasn't educated. And, but whoever wrote it, and I, I believe she did, was some writer. I mean, that, those opening uh, paragraphs are wonderful. And the plot really sizzles. Uh, of course, it looks so tame now. I mean, if you went back to try to read that book, it'd be like a Bible. <laughs> I think God just punished me for saying that. <laughs> anyway, uh, I gave the title of this speech some time ago, months ago, and I picked a very safe one. I said I was going to talk about a thousand plus hours of talk. And uh, that's an easy title because you can say anything <laughs> underneath it. And I've certainly done more than a thousand plus hours of it in my long career at National Public Radio. But as a matter of fact, um, my topic tonight certainly is the humanities. After all, you are giving me dinner and I know which side of the bread uh, is buttered on. But, but really it's, it's about the importance of a liberal arts education. And uh, yes. <laughs> I had the feeling you would feel that way too. And I bet a bunch of you are academics and really feel that way. And whoever lead, led those incredible children certainly believes it as well. Um, a, a good education in liberal arts in school and also in life because they have to be interconnected. And I hope you won't mind that I'm gonna make it a bit personal uh, as I go along. And, it will give me some discomfort, not for you, I hope, but for me, because as a journalist, the last thing I get to do in, in my job is to talk about myself. The job of a journalist for decades, uh, particularly in my anchoring days, for all things considered, then weekend edition on Sunday, was to talk about you, the men and women I report on, your doings, your concerns, your thinking, your anxieties and the things that you were creating. The point has always, for all of these years, this has changed these days as you get to hear everybody's opinion about everything. Uh, but in, in the days when uh, I was really beginning, the point was never to, never to talk about yourself or give your opinions, but to report on the rest of the world. That's reporting, it's what it is or it should be. And one of my deeply held beliefs, and although everything has many things have so changed, is that journalists really have to earn the right to say I. You don't just shove it into people's ears. You earn the right. You have to get their respect and get their interest and their curiosity and earn it through the work that you do. And then you have permission to talk about yourself because it's not your main job. Uh, I, I feel uh, it's rude to say it, but the eyes are really none of your business. We need to keep them to ours. Oh, there he goes again, really? <laughs> you know what? When I need water, some lovely gentleman's gonna come here, pick it up and hand it to me, aren't you? <laughs> anyway, I guess I've been at it long enough. It's more than 40 years now at NPR. As you heard, I'm a founding mother of the place. 
I guess I've got enough gray hairs to, to have earned the right to eye you this evening, so here goes. I want to talk about my life as a cultural reporter. It's, it's a life, and it's been a very lucky one and a blessed one, spent in conversations with the most creative people in our society. Usually, they are not politicians. And I have to tell you, although I am fresh out of Washington this morning, I'm not discussing politics at all with you this evening. Yes! Thank you. I was afraid you would expect it, and I just want to tell you, sometimes at home, uh, at dinners and with friends, we declare the evening a Trump-free zone <laughs> so that we really can talk about other things. And so I'll declare this room a Trump-free zone for the rest of my, my time, just so we can be thinking about some other things for a while. Uh, but I've been lucky to talk with extraordinarily creative people, novelists, actors, artists, dancers, photographers, musicians, people who define the liberal arts. And by liberal arts, I mean that vast spectrum of studies in art, music, language, history, government, even math, science, social science, that give us a sense of the vast world in which we live, not just a narrow, specialized part of it, not just technical or vocational studies, which will give a better chance of nailing a job. That's important, too, but it's not all there is. A broad liberal arts education makes you able to tackle any job that you are lucky enough to land with a depth and ability that a narrow specialization just will not provide. That's the end of that part of my sermon, although I may uh, get a little religion afterwards as I go along. I'm a cultural reporter these days after decades of serving as a news hen. My task for most of my earliest years at uh, NPR was to do daily journalism. 14 years, at all things considered, uh, was news. Uh, for, my, for me to do as the host, uh, and it still really is the meat and potatoes of every day's broadcast, but throughout those ATC years, my dessert was always the humanities, the liberal arts. Every evening on the air, we would tell what had happened in the world that day, and on good days, which for me meant a slow news day, what happened to me was that I had had the chance to interview a writer preferably someone who created fiction or poetry. On HEC, I tried to redefine the news, to remember William Carlos Williams, and to say that news was not just what was happening in, happening in Afghanistan or Syria or wherever or on Capitol Hill, that it's also news when Ann Tyler writes a new novel. And the chance to interview a novelist or a dramatist, a performer, as well as philosophers, folklorists, many of the other ists who make up the liberal arts, the chance to talk with them on a news program was what got me through all of those heavy news days when it just seemed relentless. I would choose five minutes with a performance artist over four hours with Paul Ryan any day of the week. <laughs> And this is not a matter of politics, I promise you, it really isn't. It is simply that the creative mind has always held much more fascination for me than the political one, no matter who the politician and almost you know, no matter who the artist is. I think the preference has something to do with compromise, but this is sort of a narrow uh, little thing and I'm not sure I really mean it or I, I'm not sure I'm really nailing it because artists usually tend to be against it. That is, they don't want to compromise. They want to do the painting their way. They want to do the dance their way. Many are in very collaborative uh, 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 media, like film or, or theater. But nonetheless, nonetheless, the vision of the creative person really ha has, is usually done, exists without compromise. I admire and I often envy them for that. Then again, these politicians are usually against compromise too. That doesn't make them artistic particularly. <laughs> There's nothing artistic about the way they resist compromise. For the last several decades, once I gave up anchoring 
as a cultural correspondent, pretty much 100% of my time is spent with people in the arts and the humanities. And this is very much a matter of choice for me. It's the job that I asked for when I left All Things Considered, and I asked for again a few years after I put Weekend Edition Sunday on the air. Because I believe that if the world is to be saved, it is not the politicians who will save it. God knows we have evidence of that every single day, right now. It's the ones who make art and literature who will save us. The ones who study other cultures, who study their languages, their rituals, the people who learn to respect differences and to offer ideals and idealism. They are the ones who are going to piece sense together from these increasingly tattered times. This is why I believe so deeply in the importance of a liberal arts education, because it helps to create a full, well-rounded, well-informed human being, a human being who is capable of piecing sense together for the betterment of us all. This is not to put too huge a responsibility on their shoulders, but I think it's possible for them to do it. And also, the arts themselves, in particular, are just so important because they take you to a place where you usually don't hang out. They take you to some higher realm, some place that takes your mind off the, the difficulties of the day and clears your mind so that you can go back and face and solve and encounter the really rough things that are going on in this world. And we need the arts to do that for us, too. It's a kind of therapy, and I don't want to say it's only therapeutic, but it's something very powerful that it does. But my commitment to the study of liberal arts and the decision on my part to devote my working life to cultural reporting is also a commitment to community, to the things and creations that can bring us together, not keep us separate. It's a commitment to reporting often on things that last, not the titillations of yesterday's irrelevances. Most of my work as a journalist involves conducting interviews, and usually that means talking with strangers, which is the best and often the most difficult part of what I do, talking to strangers and asking them questions, and then listening as creatively as I can to the answers. And that really has been my joyful impulse pretty much since I was a child, back in those days in the kitchen in Manhattan with the uh, paint box in front of me and pieces of paper and the radio on, a little Bakelite radio that sat on the kitchen table. I did that kind of talking for years before I ever got near a microphone. High school friends of mine would have very mixed feelings about coming to my house for sleepovers because they knew I would keep them up all night asking them questions. <laughs> And I've been lucky enough to have found a career in something that started out as an impulse, something I couldn't control. I always told our son Josh that if he was really lucky, he would find something that he loved to do and then figure out a way to get paid to do it. God bless him, you know, he followed my advice. That was a great surprise, but he did. He's an actor. Uh, and when he, said, he told me he wanted to do that, he told my husband and me, I said, um, well, don't be an actor, but if you might, I was encouraging him to marry a mortgage banker because <laughs> I knew how difficult it was, life was going to be for him. I said, but if you must be an actor, an actor, be a movie star because then you can buy me my house in Malibu. <laughs> Guess what? I live in Washington, D.C. still. But he's, you know, he's, he's that... Uh, anachronism that you think about. He is a working actor, a working actor. And he has a wonderful family, he, uh, two granddaughters, uh, no, his or daughters, my grandchildren, and a life that he finds fulfilling. Uh, and people, but back to this whole idea of, of doing the journalism and asking the questions, uh, they often ask a lot about what my favorite interview was, and that is so, such a hard question, I really can't answer it because I've done something like 20,000 or probably more by now over all of these years. Uh, but when pressed, I, I pick a conversation I taped a long time ago, 1977, with Joan Didion. And in publishing it, which I did in my second favorite book, which is out of print, so this is not self-promotion. <laughs> 
I, I write about the practice of interviewing in general and that very curious art form of broadcasting. You hear and you see it being done all the time, but those of us who do it don't talk very much about what's involved, the, the sort of the nuts and bolts of it, how it feels to do it. So I decided to write about it. I like to demystify our process. I think it's really important uh, for you to understand what journalism takes and what the elements of it are. Uh, I like empowering listeners and those of you who consume news need to know how we do it and why. So here's uh, what I wrote. I need my specs for it, so give me a second here to write about uh, a broadcast interview. When it's really good, it should sound as if the tape's been forgotten. It should sound absolutely natural, like a real-life conversation but it never really is. There's nothing natural about it. You sit across a table from a complete stranger in a room lined with gray foam, egg carton-shaped acoustic padding. You wear a headset that lets you monitor the quality of the sound. You glance at a digital clock that is counting off elapsed time. You nod to a wall of glass behind which sits an audio engineer, possibly an editor and a producer, all of whom are taking notes so that they can cut the tape that you are making. And then you talk into pieces of electronic wizardry that will eventually carry your voice and the voice of your interviewee outside this equipment laden room and into people's cars and kitchens. And now these, these days, earbuds. There's nothing natural at all about it. A conversation designed to be overheard. A broadcast interview forces the interviewer to listen with a kind of third ear, to make constant mental notes about follow-up, about when to change the subject when it's getting boring, about how to get a more concise response than the person who is wandering many different roads in front of you about where the tape might be cut. And when it's done very well, a broadcast interview gives 12 million, well these days it's much more than that, it's something like 34 million listeners, the illusion that they are eavesdropping. So keep that in mind the next time you hear all of these people yammering away on the radio and also on television, maybe particularly on television. Uh, the photographer Richard Avedon said once that a portrait photo photography session involves what he called an unearned intimacy. I love that term because it precisely de describes the exchange between myself and some of the people I interview. We sound intimate. We sound often as if we're very close and having an extremely natural chat, but it is a performance. Yes, some of the work of journalism is entertainment and usually both sides are very aware of it. Curiously, when I asked Richard Avedon in an interview about that phrase, unearned intimacy, he too said it was like what we were doing, he and I, right then. We are the same, Susan, he said. We use people to express ourselves. There is no question you can't intimate. We sound often as if we're very close and having an extremely natural chat but it is a performance. Yes, some of the work of journalism is entertainment, and usually both sides are very aware of it. Curiously, when I asked Richard Avedon in an interview about that phrase, unearned intimacy, he too said it was like what we were doing, he and I, right then. We are the same, Susan, he said. We use people to express ourselves. There is no question you can't ask me in the interview in the next few minutes that I won't have to respond to. And then he said, if you came over to me at a party and asked me the kinds of questions you're asking me now, I would either turn away or I would say, are you an anchor lady? What is this? Well, you know, Avedon said, this is not a normal conversation, Susan. Well, you know, he's right and he's wrong. I don't agree with Avedon that I use people to express myself. Here we go again with that I business. I talk with people and I try to help them express themselves. And I also disagree with him saying that ours was not a normal conversation. 
that if I came over at a party and I asked those questions, he would leave, or he'd say, are you an anchor lady, what is this? I think that's wrong. And I spoke to many of you this evening, and you know, I think you've experienced what I'm talking about. I ask questions. I do it all the time. I ask many of you questions out in the lobby, and or, or, as we met one another, I wanted to know where you were from and where you grew up, and tell me about your family, and what do you do? It's just sort of an instinct that pours out of me. I do interview people at parties. I've done it all my life. I was talking about uh, Joan Didion and also about literature and about doing journalism, I've spent some time thinking about the differences between the two kinds of writing. As a journalist, somebody involved in the writing and presentation of facts, do you remember that word? Facts, F-A-C-T-S. Yes, let's hear it for facts. <laughs> I must say that uh, I have a deep-seated envy of the people who can write fiction, and all, also an envy of those of you here today who are privileged and enlightened enough to teach it, and I bet there are several English teachers among you. It's a standing joke around the NPR newsroom to say never let facts get in the way of a good story. Maybe that's why the term fake news has originated, I don't know, but it's a joke. It's a joke, I promise you. But you know, with good journalism, the facts always very often do get in the way. In news, we deal with the who, what, when, where, and how. But only in fiction can the writer really know the why. You know, it's five W's and an H. Four W's and an H. Why explore by, and, and the, the fiction writer can do it by exploring morals and values. And that most important area of all, the one that is always the toughest to really get at, which is motivation. How come they did it? What was the reason? What was behind it? What did they really want? And Didion wrote once that what interests a great fiction writer is only rarely what interests, in the same situation, a reporter. I love this distinction. She says, the novelist's interest in a situation wanes at that precise point when the reporter begins to consider herself competent, when the place is understood, when it begins to come clear, when the remarkable becomes commonplace and the course of a day can be predicted. Didion means that when the ambiguities are gone, the journalist's job is well done. But when the ambiguities are gone, the novelist loses interest because novelists love poking around ambiguities and figuring, figuring things out. Saul Bellow also made a distinction between journalism and literature, and it's a distinction that I cherish as a broadcaster. It's something that he said in an interview in Esquire magazine years ago. This was years before CNN, which now lets us watch war and tragedy and disaster live in real time, sometimes while we're eating our dinner and the television is on. But back in uh, the early 80s, Bella was worrying about the way sensationalistic reporting was shifting our values and compressing our attention spans. Bellow said about journalism, about reporting, that although you are reading about it all the time, you can't find out what is happening in this world. You can't find out what's happening humanly. Unless you pass it through your own soul, you don't understand it. He thought that the deepest realities in our day come from art. And of course, I agree with that. I would add the humanities as well, the civilizing forces in our world that amplify understanding. I hope that the kind of journalism we practice at NPR is a civilizing force. It's been my life mission to make it so, to help to create a community of listeners, and I know you are one, who turn on their radios or now their various devices, their iPods, their clever little smart equipments, for something that they know they can't find any place else, to feel that they will be informed, educated, entertained by what they hear from us. There is such a public radio community now, people who sit next to one another on airplanes and find that they have something in common because they listen to NPR. There's an instant bond. 
My favorite encounters with listeners are when someone says they moved around all their lives. They went to high school, junior high in one place, and high school in another, college in another, graduate school someplace else, and the only thing that remained constant was NPR. I love that idea. And in a nation of strangers, Uh, in, in a nation of strangers, where moving is the status quo, knowing that radio can build community is most reassuring, that we have represented the sound of home. And I remember this personally from a time when my husband and I were driving through a part of New, New Mexico where we'd never been, and driving and looking in the landscape kept changing, and we, we didn't have a sense of where we are, how did we get here, what are we doing here? And we had the radio on, and All Things Considered came on, and I heard my partner, Noah Adams' voice, and I felt I was at home. I felt grounded, because there was Noah. Um, some years back, the great art historian Vincent Scully presented the annual Jefferson Lecture in the Humanities in Washington. It's an NEH lecture series, and it's quite an honor to be chosen for it. The Jefferson Lectureship is the top honor that the federal government gives to recognize distinguished work in the humanities. Scully's theme was the architecture of community, and he spoke about elements of the built environment which bring people together in new ways, just as these modern devices, cell phones, iPhones, Facebook, social media, are bringing us together now in new ways. Scully mentioned the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, for example. How many of you have seen that? Come to Washington, good. I'm glad you've gone to see it. And if you haven't, make a point of it uh, the next time you go there. Uh, it is surely the greatest piece of public sculpture created in our lifetimes. On the mall in Washington, it's a black granite wall designed by Maya Lin, who was a 21-year-old architecture student at Yale. I think she was a student of Scully's there when she won the competition. Uh, I interviewed her some years ago. She was a listener and a fan of ours. And she told me that uh, at Yale, working on this design, the way she figured out her angles was with mashed potatoes in the, in the cafeteria. <laughs> she would order mashed potatoes every meal, and she'd fool around with the knife, sort of making wedges, until she got a, an angle that was satisfying to her. Scully said uh, very seriously, though, that in her memorial, his words, you see the possibility of a new community in America, made up of all the different kinds of people that we are, as all kinds of people, men, women, blacks, gays, move up and down in front of that surface, they are reflected in it, and reach out and touch their dead, and bring those veterans who thought that their country had cast them out back into the human community once more. Scully spoke about modern urbanism, how our cities were ruined in the 1960s when they became faceless canyons of glass boxes. He blamed it on Le Corbusier, who in the 1920s said how awful the old narrow streets were where you have to look at the faces of other human beings all the time. So depressing, he said. Let's get rid of it. Let's clean it up. And the architects responded over the, over the centuries by creating huge anonymous super blocks and cross highways so that nobody had to look at anybody anymore. I fear that that happens online now, too, as a matter of fact, with our new modern machinery. We all sit in front of screens now rather than encounter and have to deal with one another face to face. I thought of all of this when I paid attention for NPR to the work of two visual artists, Edward Hopper of America and Gustav Kayabat of France. I'll tell you some about him because he's uh, less well known. Strand was the former U.S. Poet Laureate and he wrote a book on Hopper. Oh, it's a wonderful little book, which I think of every time I report on this or that exhibition of Hopper's work. Strand started out as an art major at Yale. Later, he turned to poetry, but he never lost his interest in the visual arts. And his little book on Hopper is full of wonderful observations. Strand says Hopper's painting looked like scenes that he saw as a child from the back seat of his parents' car. Incomplete stories, he said. Lives seen at street level. That woman leaning out the window, what is she looking for? Why is she there? 
that man staring into space, sitting at his gas station, those people in the nighttime diner who look as if they're drinking coffee from hell. He, uh, Hopper made that before the days of Starbucks. I don't know your opinion on Starbucks. You know that Hopper painting, it's called Nighthawks. You've seen it dozens of times, posters, mugs, greeting cards. Strand's idea of glimpsed lives, unfinished stories, connect, connected for me with Scully's observations on the old view of cities, when you had to look at the faces of other human beings, the urban places that we have created put those lives on upper floors now. We can't see them from the back of cars anymore. Edward Hopper painted what to me seemed very lonely, isolated people, although he denied that, but people who were not making connections even though they lived at street level, surrounded by other lives. You think now how the tall buildings that went up after 1942, which was the year he painted Nighthawks, think how, uh, how uh, th those buildings would have made his people feel even more alienated these days. And at the Arts Institute of Chicago, that wonderful museum which owns Hopper's Nighthawks, there was a terrific exhibition of the work of Gustav Kayabat. Are you familiar with his name? It's spelled C-A-I-L-L-E-B-O-T-T-E. -T -T -E. He was a 19th century urban impressionist, known to me initially because of his monumental painting of a man and a woman under a gray umbrellas walking down these massive cobblestone streets in Paris. It's called Paris Street, Rainy Day. He did it in 1877, and you may know it from coffee mugs and the same thing, and umbrellas and uh, the same things that you know Hopper from. Uh, he did not have a public life as a painter, which is really why he's only been rather recently, I'd say in the last 20 years or so, discovered is a silly word to use for somebody uh, who's been around, but anyway, uh, there it was. He did something like 500 pictures, but he, he, they stayed in the family. He never uh, had exhibits of them, and he, so as a result, he never became, he didn't have to have exhibits, he didn't have to sell them, because he was very wealthy. So as a result, he uh, never became as well known as Monet or Renoir, but his, his wealth allowed him to become a great patron of the arts, and he bought up the works by his friends, Monet, Manet, Renoir, Degas, Cezanne. And those works became the heart of what is now the Musée d'Orsay uh, in Paris, their Impressionist collection. In his own work, he was painting what was happening to Paris when Baron George Eugène Haussmann began turning it into a modern city, putting in those huge boulevards of Paris and iron bridges and rows of identical big apartment buildings. Now to us, it all looks very beautiful and very quaint, those embellished buildings of 19th century Paris. But back then, they were modern, and they stood for modernism. And Kayabat, as an urban impressionist, was painting people as they were isolated and ignored by these new structures. His streets are enormous. His people, who were very prettily dressed in the style of their day, carrying their umbrellas, their parasols, wearing their long skirts, their top hats, they look lost on those streets. They are alone while sharing a common space. He paints a man leaning on a bridge rail and looking down, absolutely engulfed by huge girders. He is dwarfed by the bridge he's standing on, isolated just the way Hopper's people were in the 1930s and 50s. So these artists, Kayabat and Hopper, were painting what happens to community as modernity progresses, and also the longing for community that I think we feel from the moment we leave home and lose that first and most basic community of our birth. They painted the feeling of modern life at two very different but very similar times. In looking at their work, we are forced to feel, to connect with what's going on on those canvases to connect with our own apprehensions about change, with our own search for a community, forced to feel, which is what great art always does. I think all of us long for community. You obviously have, have one here, several probably, and they're strong and they're wonderful. Some of us find it through religion or through family or neighborhood or work or yes, art, art, 
The great book, the great piece of music, the play, the dance, painting, gives us the truths of our times. It synthesizes our feelings or our fears, our aspirations. It helps us to look at ourselves and our times in new ways. It helps us to express what's been inexpressible beyond the language that we ourselves can create. And that's why I've chosen to spend this part of my life in journalism as a cultural correspondent, to try to track those expressions and to bring them to my listeners through the radio in their cars or the iPod bud in their ears. When the novelist uh, Tobias Wolf got the Penn Faulkner Award for fiction uh, a few years ago, he spoke of the power of words, a power, he said, so great that one of the first things that any tyrant does is to bully writers into silence or to murder them. We've seen that happen in Russia recently, haven't we? Especially with journalists. Or to put them in camps, in jail, or force them into exile where their voices cannot be heard. But, Toby Wolf said, the true power belongs to them, and in the end, they will be heard. That's why, he said, we honor Ovid over Caesar, Solzhenitsyn over Stalin, Lorca over Franco, Shakespeare over any king. So it has always been, and so it will always be. So my thanks to Toby Wolf for putting into writing the kind of case I've been trying to make for the arts and the humanities as a radio journalist for all these years, and for doing it so forcefully and far more economically than I've been doing it. So my thanks to you too, first of all, for inviting me and for letting me exercise my eye in public. It's lovely to meet you all. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Shall I go? You can stay for a minute. I'll move back. I'm going to get my drink. Thanks, everybody. I wanted to thank Susan for her, I wanted to make sure I got this right. Thank you for sharing your eyes. Yeah. Your talk tonight seemed to be so much more than unearned intimacy. It felt like real intimacy. Uh -huh. And I, for one, could listen to you and talk with you for hours. Uh, thank, thank you, you very, very, very much. <laughs> And that concludes our event. I want to take this opportunity to thank all of you once again. We can't do this great work without you. We welcome your feedback, your ideas, your contributions to help us do what we do best, connecting people with ideas. Please stay engaged and encourage others to join you. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.